many years ago, I had an interesting opportunity to meet somebody of so-called renown eventually. It was about 1962, the latter part of it. Uh, I had graduated from the chiropractic college and had moved to Hamilton. And uh, I wasn't very busy, and at nighttime, sometimes I would slip down to this bar that had entertainment of various sorts. And during the times that I had been there, I became a good acquaintance, almost, a, I guess, a friend, with the MC. Uh, he was a black man, about 6'2 or 3, about 250 plus. Anyway, his name, or so he said, was Charlie Eckstein. And Charlie said to me one night, he said, hey, Doc, he said, why don't we get in business and bring some entertainment in here, some good stuff in from the States. I said, okay. So Charlie and I went to over to Buffalo, and we went to the Club Moon Glow, and it was full of blacks. Charlie said, you just stand beside me, Doc, and they ain't going to bother you none. Anyway, we uh, used to uh, get entertainers from there, and we brought over uh, musicians, uh, singers, uh, comedians, and the like. And we were doing okay, I guess, uh, having making sure that they were well paid, and we got a portion of it to make sure that everything was safe and sorry for them. And it was a time when you didn't need green cars because we just drove in because we were whatever. One time we brought in this new young lad, skinny lad, black kid. Uh, his name, he said he came from Peoria, Illinois, and his, uh, he was raised in his mother's brothel. But this person was, had a tendency to fabricate, and his name was Richard Pryor. Well, Richard, over a period of a couple of weeks, was doing a really good job for us in this place, drawing the crowds in, and everybody was happy with him, and he was humorous. There was no getting around it. One night, uh, uh, he was not on stage at that time. This guy came in, a man, pulled a gun out and said, Where's Richard? I want that little bastard. He's been fooling around with my wife. He had a gun. And uh, Charlie happened to be on stage at that time. Uh, and he happened to be singing. I can't stop loving you. And this guy came out with a gun up in the air. Bang! Where's Richard? <clears throat> Jeez, the, the band that was there, except for the drummer, all disappeared off the end of the stage. The drummer sat there going, ba -doom, ba -doom. and Charlie kept singing, I can't stop loving you. <laughs> and he was getting closer and closer to the end of the stage. <laughs> so fine, finally, the bouncers grabbed this guy and they were wrestled around the floor and they got a gun away from him and that was the end of that story. So the manager of the whole bar thing came over to Charlie and said, Charlie, you, you got to get rid of him. That's obviously too much of a risk to have Richard around anymore. So we took him over to another club in downtown Hamilton. It was a downstairs bar. And he did pretty well there too. Was that, was that the Flamingo Club? Yeah, and in the yeah, Flamingo Club, yeah. And in the meantime, though, Charlie uh, was extending his wings, and he was able to get a hold of the uh, whatever management or whatever of the Benny Goodman band, without Benny, of course, uh, that was moving through the area. And we booked them for one night at the Drake Hotel. That's in Hamilton? In Hamilton. And uh, we... Uh, got Richard to entertain people when the band would take breaks. But Richard all of a sudden figured he was high time, so he said, I can't go dress like this, I gotta have some nice clothes. So I took him down to a, a well-known haberdashery place where they made suits and all that kind of stuff, called Copley, Noise, and Randall in Hamilton and got him a three-piece gray suit because I had one kind of like that and he wanted double-breasted too. And everything was fine. Peach again. Charlie did, or Richard did a good job for us except he happened to have an open, we gave him an open bar and by the time the evening was finished 
we just about were lucky enough to break even because of Richard's bloody barbell. <laughs> Next phase of the game was we went to, I took Richard to Toronto, to a club down on Jarvis Street. And uh, the la uh, management guy said, well, I don't know if I, I want to hear what he does or doesn't do. So he said, uh, what can you do? And Richard said, I can't do anything unless I have accompaniment. The guy said, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I need music. I, uh. The guy said, okay. So he roasted up one of their local band things that they had sitting at the hotel. And this guy came down with an acoustic guitar, not hooked up to anything. So it was, and he started to play and he was plunk, 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 plunk. And that's about what it sounded like because it wasn't hooked up to the noise. And Richard proceeded to produce a skit that I had never seen before. And it was about a diver with a knife in his mouth swimming and then sharks came after him, and his eyes got big, and he dang, and all I got laughing, and the plunk, plunk, plunk guy got laughing, finally the manager got laughing, he said, cut it out, that you're hired. Well, that was great, we got Charlie into the big town, Richard. or Richard into the big town, but they didn't put him on the list, and his bar bill was more than the wages, and Richard disappeared. Fortunately, I didn't hear from the little shit for quite some time. Then all of a sudden, oh, a few years later, uh, I had a phone call, and it was that same dumb drummer that had gone ba dum, ba dum, ba dum when Charlie was singing, "I can't stop loving you," and he'd gone with Richard, and they were down in the states, and he said, "Doc, Doc," he said, "Good investment for you. We got a deal." He said, uh, Richard's going to make a movie. I said, you guys skin me so hard, you know, and everything. I said, no, thank you very much, but no, enjoy yourselves. Well, Richard was in the movie, and it was a poor movie. It was Silver Streak. I kicked my ass for the next 15 years. That's the end. That's the Richard Pryor story. Richard Pryor story.